Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Bill Mack. I'm the director of the Center for Chinese Research uh, here at the ISF Academy. So today, uh, we are very uh, honored uh, to have a very distinguished speaker, uh, Professor Elizabeth Sin, who will be uh, speaking to us on the topic of immigration from slash through Hong Kong from 1850 to 1950. So just a brief introduction to Professor Sin. Um, Professor Elizabeth Sin was born and raised in Hong Kong. She has written widely on Hong Kong history. Before her retirement, she was the deputy director of the Center of Asian Studies at the University of Hong Kong, and is today an honorary professor at the Hong Kong Institute for the Humanities and Social Sciences. She is currently an expert advisor to the Hong Kong Museum of History and works closely with the Hong Kong Chronicles project. Having served on the Antiquities Advisory Board and the Lord Wilson Heritage Trust, she was awarded the Bronze Bohemia Star in 2004 for her contribution to heritage conservation. She had led the Hong Kong Memory Project, that is from 2006 to 2013, to create a multimedia website for materials on Hong Kong's history, culture, and heritage. Her own favorite book is Pacific Crossing, California Gold, Chinese Migration, and the Making of Hong Kong. We just <laughs> my own copy uh, of the book. Um, and there's also a Chinese uh, translation for those who are interested. Um, and her latest <laughs> publication, Making Money in South China, uh, Hoa Mei and his Silver Mountain Dream, uh, published in the Journal of Hong Kong branch of the Royal Asi Asiatic Society, uh, which tells the history of the silver mine in Silver Mine Bay. Well, without further ado, um, the floor is yours, Professor Sin. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Good. Um, I'm delighted to be here. And let me thank the organizers for inviting me. I really love talking. <laughs> I love talking about my research. And I, more than that, I love sharing my research interest and my research finding with others. And every time I talk, I know that I will get very challenging questions and stimulating questions in return. So that is, for me, extremely rewarding. So I look forward to interacting with you after this talk. Um, I know the questions are supposed to be for um, after the talk, but at any point when you feel that you're really stuck and you don't know what I'm going on about, please do put your hands up and we will see what your question is and see if I can help you, all right? Yeah. But today we're gonna to talk about the in-between place, immigration from and through Hong Kong, 1850 to 1950. And in, uh, I will talk about the in-between place later because I think that is a very important concept. But I also call it emigration from and through Hong Kong because most of the people who emigrated from Hong Kong were actually not living in Hong Kong. And they only used Hong Kong as a transit port on the way of when, they re when they relocate from the home villages, mostly in South China, to some overseas location, right? So this is why I use from and through Hong Kong. By the end of the 19th century and the early 20th centuries, there were some people going from Hong Kong who had actually lived in Hong Kong for a certain number of time, certain number of years, and maybe even several, um, several generations. So from the late 19th and early 20th century, we started having people going from the new territories. All right. But the numbers were really, really small compared to the people who came from other parts of China into Hong Kong on their way out to the um, outside world. So if we look at the numbers, we'll see 6.3 million Chinese traveled out from Hong Kong to all parts of the world between 1868 and 1939. And 1868 is the year when we, have, we started having really um, a fairly good statistics. Right? And over 7 million Chinese traveled back to Hong Kong from all parts of the world between 1868 and 1939. Now, of course, these numbers 
don't sound very large to you, right? But if you go back to looking at the actual situation on the ground, we'll realize that these numbers are really big numbers. In 1871, the total number of people living in Hong Kong was 124,000. But the number of people passing through Hong Kong was 9,500, all right? Now, I should emphasize that the number of immigrants were not from the population of Hong Kong, but they were coming through. But what they needed was a really large number of people to service the migration trade, all right? And I hope that later I will show you how many people were actually involved with migration business, all right? So, and in 1881, when we had 160,000 people in Hong Kong, 70,000 people emigrated, all right? So these were really large numbers. And I hope that by giving these numbers, it gives you a sense of the scale. Okay. So what I'd like to do uh, is to cover this subject, the immigration of uh, people through Hong Kong, is to ask five questions. All right. Why did Chinese migrate? Where did they go? Why did they travel through Hong Kong? What was the impact of the gold rush, which I will talk about uh, more fully? And what was the impact of migration on Hong Kong? Right. So first, why did Chinese migrate? Chinese people actually were quite mobile. They were much more mobile than we thought they were. And there was a lot of movement within China itself. Now, people going overseas, outside of um, Chinese territory were fewer, all right? And, but they started, did start going out in different centuries. And from about the 16th century, when um, the Philippines were taken over by the Spanish, there was quite a big number of Chinese going from Fujian to the Philippines, all right? So this was the big sort of big, first big migration overseas. Um, but the really big migration from our perspective is the 19th century, when really large numbers of Chinese went. So the question is, why did they go? Well, one very, very big, well, we, we still think of pull factors and push factors, all right? Although today, uh, migration studies people have a more sort of nuanced study of what, was, what were pull factors and what were uh, push factors. But let, let's just look at this using a simple uh, formula, and that is the pull factors. There was a need for uh, cheap labor after the abolition of slavery, all right? From 1833, the British government started a very big campaign uh, to abolish slavery. They abolished slavery within Britain, but also they tried to abolish slavery around the world, all right? So they were sort of hegemons, so they said, slavery is bad, Everybody else had to say slavery was bad, all right? Everybody had to um, try and um, comply with the British laws, okay? So when the Afri these African slavery trade ended and plantation owners, mine owners, and other capitalists could no longer use African slaves, they had to find cheap labor somewhere else. So there was this huge demand for cheap bodies, all right? Now, today we talk about the grab for talent. Everybody in the world, every country is trying to get talent, all right? In those days, they were not looking for talent. They just wanted bodies, all right? Lots of muscles and uh, <laughs> workers, people who were obedient and uh, could work, okay? So there was this draw factor and people went around the world looking for cheap substitutes for African slaves. And there were two kinds of people whom they targeted. And of course, they were from the most populous countries in the world, India and China, all right? And so the, the, you will find a lot of Indians, third, fourth, fifth generation now, living in, or in different parts of the world. And there was a, a sort of a debate um, among people at that time of who were the better workers, the Indians or the Chinese? Um, they were cheap, they were all cheap, um, but they thought, well, Chinese were probably a little better because although the Chinese uh, smoked opium, 
after they smoked opium, they just went to sleep. They didn't make trouble. The Indians, on the other hand, for their leisure, drank. And after they got drunk, they became very rowdy, and they make trouble, and they fought, all right? So there was this sort of comparison between which is the better labor, the Chinese labor, or oh, who was the China? Who were the better workers, all right? Who were more cost effective to acquire? Okay. Now, some people who went out to work actually wanted to go out because they were better opportunities. From the mid 19th century onwards, with um, well, first of all, you had Portuguese and Spanish uh, colonial expansion, but with the British expansion and American expansion, there were m many more commercial opportunities. There were people coming in to invest in mines, people coming in to set up uh, shipping companies and trading companies, insurance companies and so on. And all these companies needed uh, labor. But at the same time, these companies also offered investment opportunities for Chinese people as well. All right? So many of them went out to serve as clerks, they went out to serve as shopkeepers, and of course, some of them became very wealthy themselves, all right? And they started to invest in plantations and mines. Um, more people went because there was better communication. Um, later in the 19th century, they started having telegraphs. There were better shipping, right? Uh, and the Suez Canal was, uh, was opened. So the world became much more um, attuned to, well, much more mobile. And it was easy for um, it was easy for people to travel, and it was easier for people to send labor as well as to send goods. Okay. Then there were special events, the events like the uh, discovery of gold in in California, and what was really interesting was at that time after gold was discovered in California, a couple of years later they discovered gold in Australia and then in New Zealand, and then in British Columbia. So from about 1848 to about 1860, 65, there was just a whole lot of gold discoveries, all right? And this was a huge pull factor because everybody wanted to find gold. Okay. And then there were other, other um, events, other opportunities, other uh, requirements for labor, such as the building of the railroads, uh, the most famous, of course, is um, across the American continent. Right. And then you had um, building the Panama Canal, for instance, that required a lot of labor. And then in the early 20th century, there was a big demand for rubber. So rubber plantations, Malaysia, also drew a lot of workers. Okay. So we had these, uh, and, uh, drew a lot of workers and a lot of capital. And sometimes it's hard to distinguish between workers and labor and, and capital because very often people started, when they went out, they were laborers and they end up being becoming uh, capitalist. Well, hmm. They went into business. Now, so these were the main pull factors. The outside world looked very good, right? Now, the inside world looked terrible and this is the push factor, all right? So the poor conditions in China uh, in a way, China was the victim of its own success because the 17th and 18th century in China were huge, very prosperous centuries, and there was a huge explosion of population. So by the early 19th century, there was a uh, there was serious overpopulation, and the, there was a great um, grab for land. All right, there was not enough land to support the population at the existing level of technology. And there were a lot of upheavals. We know about the Opium Wars. The, the two Opium Wars had a big impact on Chinese society and on the Chinese government because China had to pay huge indemnities. So when you had to pay these indemnities, the government had to tax people more. Okay. And also with the incoming of foreign produced goods, it meant that a lot of the native pr productions were def uh, suffered all right, because the factory produced cotton, for instance, or factory produced woolen were much cheaper in comparison and probably a lot of more durable in, in comparison. And of course, we know about the Taiping Rebellion. All right, this was one of the most disastrous uh, civil, civil war in China. All right, and, the, and it just devastated a huge, 
huge areas in China. All right, it upset society. It upset the whole idea about mandate of heaven. Right. So it was very disturbing. And, um, and there was another factor, and this is the factor, it's a sort of cumulative factor. When some of the migrants went out and they were seen to be making a lot of money, they were very successful, they found gold. And this kind of chain migration was very important. Somebody would write home and say, oh, I made zillions of dollars. Or somebody came home and bought a lot of land. All his cousins and his uncles and everybody else can see how successful he was. And everybody else would want to go. All right. So this is the, the chain migration. And very often, the migration took place on a, a village basis. All right. And sometimes some of the villages were just depleted of men because all the men went out. I think this probably happens in the Philippines too. Yeah. And actually it's interesting because, actually this is interesting too because you see there's a lot of modern comparisons that we can make about people going out, and who they left behind, and how they, the, the ones who went away, tried their best to support the families at home, right? And um, a lot of uh, heartbreaking stories about separation and death and loss. And uh, we'll come to that. And it's a very, I, I, as I, I argue, his, I, I study history in order to understand human nature better. All right. And there's, there are the certain factors, certain things about human nature that doesn't really change. So, the second question, where did they go? Well, these were the main uh, destinations. The Un United States, because of the gold rush, and then the other countries, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. Um, okay. So the red are the, what I call the gold countries. Right. So first it was, um, California, and then British Columbia, and then Australia and New Zealand. Now, when the gold rush happened, it wasn't just Chinese going. People went ev from everywhere around the world, all right? Uh, I, I've, I'll mention that a little later. And then there were people going to Mexico and Panama and Hawaii across the Pacific. This was part of the Pacific migration. Um, and then if you look at the green, it goes to Cuba and Caribbean, all right? So there was another, a third uh, uh, migration traje trajectory. The, can you see the green one there? Mm. Yeah. So it actually goes around the world and comes back to Cuba because in those days there was no Panama Canal. And so what happens was the people who wanted to go to Cuba, and Cuba was a huge migration um, hub because of the sugar plantation. And at one point in the 19th century, there were 180,000 Chinese migrants in Cuba. It was one of the biggest destinations for Chinese um, migration. And so what a ship going to Cuba would take off from Hong Kong, go down the Singapore around the um, Magellan Strait, and then go around the uh, Indian Ocean, then go down around the Cape of Good Hope in Africa. There was no Suez Canal, right? Across the Atlantic, and then across the Atlantic to end up there. All right. So it took a long, long time. And the Cuba migration was one of the saddest and most brutal migrations, partly because so a lot of people died on board. It was just a long, long, long journey. A lot of people died on board, and because of the, the conditions in Cuba were re very poor. Right. Now we'll say a little bit more about that, that particular type of migration. Now, of course, there was also migration into Southeast Asia. So you see that sort of orange thing. And that actually uh, includes the Dutch possessions. The Dutch possessions are the East India Company, which is Indonesia today. All right. And some of the Dutch possessions were in West Indies, in the Caribbean, all right? So Dutch Guiana and Suriname. 
Um, then they went to the Straits. Uh, sorry. The Straits settlements, which was Malacca, Penang, and Singapore. And from Singapore, a lot of the ships that went to Singapore would bring workers who would then spread out in that whole area. And then another group of the Hawaiian and the Pacific Islands. All right, there were a lot of people going to the South Pacific at different points, partly because they found mineral, very uh, precious minerals in the Nauru Islands. And Hawaii actually, before it became an American state, was an extremely important uh, coaling station. Right? Now, once we had the steamships, steamships need coal. And if you look at how big the Pacific Ocean is, it was impossible at that time for a ship to travel, a steamship, to travel all the way from Asia to America without finding somewhere to pick up new coal. All right, so coaling was very, very important. Right. And that is why even after the steamships came, many capt ship captains prefer to continue using or continue to sail in sail sailing boats on selling ships, because it was less dependent on fuel and was much more romantic selling a ship. You can think of, I don't know, Joseph Conrad or something. <laughs> so steamships are kind of boring for some people, right? It's more predictable. <laughs> but for maybe if you were traveling, you would prefer to travel in a steamship. <laughs> and especially after 1867, when the first steamship line came to Hong Kong, there was scheduled sailings. So at first it was like first of uh, every month and the 15th of every month you have ships departing from Hong Kong for California. All right. There were also a lot of unscheduled voyages and that is somebody would decide to charter a ship. So like charter planes today, right? People can decide to charter a plane and you can decide when to fly. Okay. So it was the same thing. There were a lot of chartered ships but very few scheduled voyages. And that only came slowly. And only with steamships were scheduled voyages possible. Right? But for many years, there was a sort of um, a war of attrition between sailing ships and steamships. Okay. And actually, steamships, when the winds were right, could sail from Hong Kong to California in about 34 days, 33, 4 days. That was a record. But most of them can do it in 40 days. However, so this is between Hong Kong and California. People coming from Liverpool, for instance, all right, or from New York, in order for them to go to California, they have to sail down the Atlantic coast along the west coast, oh, let me let me see it, along the east coast of South Africa, around the Cape, um, the Cape Horn, and then up. So it could take maybe 150 days, whereas from Hong Kong, it's 50, 30, 40 days. So for Hong Kong, it was almost natural that it became the sort of sister city with San Francisco. Okay. And, and that connection was extremely, extremely uh, important. Inevitably, people also ask, well, what, what did the migrants do? They were, as I said, they were mainly laborers and some business people, and some laborers became business people, all right? So it was, uh, but laborers actually in, covered a big uh, range of uh, work. And they were seamen. A lot of people went out as seamen and then decided to settle. They were uh, artisans. So a lot of Chinese carpenters were in demand overseas, right? And a lot of times the ships would take on carpenters so that they could work as carpenters on board and earn their uh, passage. All right, so that, that's a, and Chinese cow carpenters were considered to be excellent. Right? Now there were also people like um, stone workers um, from Hong Kong. One of the biggest uh, exports from Hong Kong in the 1850s was granite. So a huge amount, we have very good granite in Hong Kong, you'd be surprised, it's one of Hong Kong's big products, all right. So a lot of granite was transported to California because San Francisco was just be 
beginning as a city, or beginning as a town, actually. It was a very, very small village. Right? And so they had to b have buildings put up. And granite was an excellent uh, building material. So they took the granite to uh, America. They ordered the granite from Hong Kong. They would say, well, we want 50 pieces that are 10 by 2, or whatever it is, the measurement. All right. So all the cutting took place in Hong Kong. And Hong Kong stone workers were excellent. And the Hakka people in Hong Kong were considered to be excellent mason workers. All right. And so they would, some of these masons would go with the granite to San Francisco and built the buildings there. All right. So there were all kinds of laborers. Of course, some just went as sort of coolie laborers and they work in the plantations or in the mines. But some were very uh, uh, accomplished artisans. Um, now, the, then the other question is, how did they pay for the passage? Right. It was actually, actually from Hong Kong to San Francisco was quite inexpensive, sometimes 50 gold pieces, which was quite expensive. Right? So there were several groups. Uh, now, I have, to, I have to emphasize this. Any of these categories are very um, not that watertight. I mean, I'm just trying to uh, categorize them, but in fact, they, the, the line between them the, is, is much more ambiguous. Okay. So there were one kind of people was self-paying. Now, self-paying actually, mm, I mean, some people were rich enough to pay the passage, but it also meant some people who were able to borrow money from their relatives, families, all right? So when they went, they were in debt, but they were not indebted to a uh, money lender, okay? And it was also common for some families and some villages to put money together and invest in one person, all right? So they know one guy will go to San Francisco and they will all sort of put in money together to uh, send him off. So at some point, of course, he will have to repay that money. But once he became a billionaire, it was be easy. But also the important thing is he, when he made it, he would bring his cousins out, right? And his uncles and, uh, and, and, uh, and his friends, right? So this was a very important um, family commitment, all right? One guy goes out as a kind of, uh, to test the waters. And if he's successful, he will bring the rest of the, of the village. So that's one kind of um, financing, right? The other kind of financing was by credit. And that is people who go to formal or actually money lenders to uh, get, get a, an amount of money to, to pay for their uh, tickets, right? It was a big risk because if you were a, a rich person and then somebody comes and says, oh, can you lend me $100 so I can take it boat to San Francisco, and you don't know who he was, you probably say no, because you don't know where he was going, right? You have no emails, and there's no WhatsApp or anything. So once this person gets on a boat, he's, he's lost. I mean, you, he's lost to you anyway. So it was a big risk, and therefore the interest rate were very high. All right, so only by having a high interest rate could the, um, the, the financier felt that his risk was worth taking. Okay. So this guy goes off to, I mean, the, the guy who borrowed money goes off to San Francisco. Now the lender, of course, has to make sure that he gets his money back. Right? And so he would usually have an agent in San Francisco to make sure he would collect the money from this passenger. Okay. So usually you have these branch companies, branch offices, agents, and so forth. On the other side, to make sure the debt is collected. All right. and, and this is very in, important because these networks, once they were set up, could change into different kinds of networks. It could become trading networks. So this lender and his um, agent could become trading partners. And so if the trader, um, if the agent um, in San Francisco, if he collected $1,000 from all the, you know, or the debt on the debtors, thousand dollars back to the lender in Hong Kong or in Guangzhou or wherever, 
or he can use this thousand dollars and buy goods. So instead of sending the thousand dollars in cash or in gold, he could send the thousand dollars in right in uh, say American ginseng. Far case, some. All right. So this American ginseng would come to the ship, come back to Hong Kong, and it might cost a hundred, a thousand and five hundred dollars by then. So there was a profit to be made. Okay. So this was kind of of um, credit to passengers um, could be turned into trade finance. Okay. And this is really important because a lot of the money that passed between San Francisco and Hong Kong, which was huge amounts, did not take place in terms of money, but in terms of goods, in terms of cargo. Okay. And this is why these uh, different financial and business transactions fed on each other. And there was another kind that is by sale. Now, some of the um, some of the passengers were sent were put on the boats against their will. All right, they would because places like Peru and Cuba, where the conditions were very very poor, and there was no hmm, there was no confidence that they would ever return from these places. Very few people willing went willingly. So the uh, the labor contractors would kidnap men and throw them on the ships. All right. So kidnapping was one of the um, so I was kidnapping was one of the um, saddest and most common um, ways of getting bodies on board. Okay. Sometimes people were just kidnapped. Sometimes they would be drunk. They would be taken on board. Sometimes they would gamble and lost money and they would owe a gambling debt and they would go on board because they owed money. Sometimes people who were very, very poor would sell themselves and agree to sign to a contract and they would be put on board, right? And sometimes you have people who would think they were going to San Francisco and once they were on board discovered they were actually going to Indonesia, all right? So there was all kinds of, all kinds of um, fraud and um, all kinds of fraud taking place. Um, and you know, this is interesting because I think of what's happening today. You know that we have a lot of people who were uh, conned to going to Cambodia, right? Chinese from Indonesia and from Hong Kong and so forth. They were taken to, to Cambodia and thinking that they've got a job, all right? I mean, they did get a job, but then once they got there, they'll be tamed, detained and not allowed to leave. And they will be made to do things like um, making scam calls and stuff like that. So it still happens today, right? When we think we're really well educated, and we think that we are really well informed, and when the communication is so modern and so effect e e efficient, and still it happens. And there's something human nature about it, right? When people are told of wonderful things, they they will fall for them. All right. So this is the. They were sold. That is the, the, the person who was put on board, this passenger, his passage would be paid for him because he now became, became a, uh, a contract worker. All right. And this person who is uh, supposedly a contract worker, once he got to Cuba or to Peru, in the early days anyway, he would be sold as soon as he got off at the pier. And so he was really like a slave. All right, the highest, the highest bidder will buy the man as well as his contract. Okay, so these contract workers were supposed to protect the workers, but very often they did not protect the workers. All right, and many of these workers who went to um, Peru and Cuba actually never came back to China. All right, because although the contract said they were five year contracts, Nothing was said about what happened after five years. All right. So if you can't make your way back to China after five years, you've had it. Whereas later, some of the contracts will say after five years, the employer will be responsible for getting you a passage back to China. All right. So this is a, the contract itself. The terms could be very, very, could be very brutal, 
And because the, the worker himself had no idea what was in the contract, would be totally help, uh, helpless. Right? So all kinds of things were going on with this migration. A lot of people were, um, um, some of the women, for inststance, were told that they would be, they would find jobs to, as domestic servants in Singapore. All right, so they would get on a boat, and then when they got there, they discovered that they were actually prostitutes. All right, so there were a lot of the, these. Uh, I I think misinformation is the right word, but defrauding, and people were being conned. All right. Then another question. As I said, a lot of the migration that went out uh, took place um, through Hong Kong. Now, why was Hong Kong so uh, important for, mig for Chinese migration? Well, first of all, um, well maybe I should s do the second point first. And there was, in China, there was a ban against immigration. It's called Hai Jin, Hoi Gam. And the Chinese government over the centuries, um, particularly the Qing government, was very nervous about Chinese people going overseas for the reason that they might become rebellious and seditious. All right? So once they're outside of China, they were no longer controllable. All right? And this was partly because after the, the Qing, well, in the late Ming, um, some of the anti-Qing people ended in different parts of in Southeast Asia and in Taiwan, and they were and they organized re rebellions against the Qing government. All right, so the Qing government was very nervous about them. The other thing, and particularly in Taiwan, there was a guy called Zhang Tenggong, who really organ organized a large scale uprising against the Qing. All right, and in and the Qing government became so nervous that they ordered. People, all the villages within 50 li of the coast to withdraw from the coast, all right? So that they would, these people would not themselves turn into rebels, but also they would not support the rebels in Taiwan, all right? And so the Qing government over the years uh, imposed a number of bans against emigration, right? Mainly for their sort of national security reasons. And therefore, although some of the Chinese might want to go overseas, it was not convenient for them to leave from Chinese port. Even after 1842, with the Treaty of uh, Nanjing, and there were treaty ports set up, and foreign ships could go to the treaty ports, it was still risky for them to embark uh, at the treaty ports. So what they did was they would come to Hong Kong. All right. When they left for Hong Kong, they could say, we're just going to Hong Kong. Hong Kong is part of China. Hong Kong is not overseas, all right? So Hong Kong has always occupied the very ambiguous position in relation to China, all right? And we actually, this is act a good... Migration is very useful for um, highlighting that point, the, this amb ambiguous nature of Hong Kong. Right? And so Hong Kong and Macau, which was under Portuguese rule, were two places that were... Um, ideal for immigrant uh, for immigration. Okay, so people would come to Macau, they would come to Hong Kong, claiming that they were actually just mo traveling in China. But once they got into Hong Kong, they could go anywhere they wanted. All right. But why Hong Kong? Now, Hong Kong was also, in a way, at least compared to Macau, was a very uh, important, a very good port um, because it was free. And when we say free port, we actually mean two things. One, that it was an international port, that there was no discrimination against non-British ships. All right, so all the ships of all nations, when they came to Hong Kong, they were treated as if they were equal to British ships. All right, of course, this is a slight exaggeration, but, but this is important because at that time, in many cities around the world, many ports around the world, there was much discrimination against foreign ships, all right? There was a, a very protectionist attitude, policy, uh, towards foreign, uh, foreign trade. So um, foreign ships will have to pay more dues. 
they will have to have more uh, stringent examinations and so forth. All right. Whereas in Hong Kong, all the ships were treated the same. The other thing about being a free port was Hong Kong had, did not impose a um, import and export duty. Now, this is one of the most fantastic things about Hong Kong. Hong Kong really was a, a free trading port. Okay, so ships that came to Hong Kong, the, the goods can go into Hong Kong and out of Hong Kong again the tra as a transit port, as an entrepot port, without paying any duties. Now, this was, of, of course, great because it means that the, the, the goods could be paid, could be actually cost less, all right? But what is even more important was that there was much less paperwork. You didn't have to fill forms, customs forms. Um, I don't know how many of you go to the post office to send things to America. Have you ever gone to the pub? Yeah, to send things to America is a nightmare, right? Whereas if you send something to... I think Singapore doesn't have to have declarations. But to America, it's just, you know, just have to fill a lot of forms, right? So when the ships came to Hong Kong, and they didn't have to go through the customs exam inspection and so forth, everything was much quicker. And time was money. If you don't have to spend so much time being stuck in Hong Kong to check all the customs papers and so forth, you can move out much quicker, all right? So, um, and you'd have to pay uh, something called wharfage. All right, you pay less for the store, stores, you pay less for seamen, because when the, sea, when the ship is in port, you don't have to pay the seamen because nothing was happening, right? So when a, company, when a, a port was uh, a free port with no import-export duty, it was much more cost-effective, much cheaper to operate, all right? Now, compared to Macau, Macau was awful. Macau discriminated against non-Portuguese ships. In fact, Macau discriminated against non-Catholics. So everything was very complicated in Macau and very unpleasant. And Macau had import and export duties. Uh, but it, on the other hand, it will come to see where Macau had a slight edge over Hong Kong. Now, in some ways, Hong Kong had better legal protection against abuses for passengers. A lot of these passenger ships or the, the migration progress, um, the migration uh, process itself was full of fraud, full of abuses. Some of the ships were overpacked, all right, very, very crowded. Because from a ship owner's point of view, the more passengers you can put on, the more money you make, right? But from the passenger's point of view, the crowded places, the more uncomfortable, but also once you have people die, if you have a dead passenger or you have people getting sick, the more overcrowded it was, the more dangerous it was, right? And there were quite often mutinies on the, on the ships by the passengers because they were so brutal. I mean, the ships, well, first of all, some of the passengers were not volunt they didn't go voluntarily anyway. So they might be thrown onto a ship when they were drunk, but when they woke up, they realized they're going to West Indies or somewhere, right? So when they, when, when a lot of the people started realizing they were not, they were going to some strange country and they didn't even know they were going, they would organize mutinies against the the ship's um, crew, right? So the, the, this was quite common, and it was bad for everybody. It was bad for the ship, for the ship comp shipping, the company owners. It was bad for the passengers because many people died, and was was bad for the crew too, right? Yeah. So there were all these abuses, and um, so the Hong Kong government started to legislate, put in. So what, what time are we? Okay. Can somebody keep an eye on the time? Yes, we have ten more minutes. <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Let's see what I can do. Um, and so the the Hong Kong government tried to put. Um, certain laws in place, all right? And one of the first ones was the uh, Chinese Passengers Act. And this controlled two things in particular. One was to make sure that uh, the people who were put on board before the, bo the ship left to ask the passengers whether they knew where they were going. The second was to make sure that they wanted to go, that they went voluntarily, 
All right. So that to and also it restricted the number of passengers that could be put onto any ship according to the area of the ship, whether it's I think fifty foot to a passenger, or whether or according to weight, whether this this ship was a hundred or two thousand tons or whatever. Okay. So this, there was some protection. And some of this protection, the Chinese Passengers Act, came from the British policy of anti-slavery, um, the part of the British anti-slavery policy. Okay. And then in uh, 1870, the governments um, started to, uh, to prevent laborers from leaving if they had contracts or they were lab contract laborers who were going to non-British territories, which meant that if a, um, a company wanted Chinese laborers to go and work in Dutch Guiana, right, and wanted contract laborers, they could not take ship from Hong Kong. All right, the rationale was the British, the colonial government in Hong Kong felt that it could, that only those laborers going to British territories could be safe because only in British territories could they guarantee the contract terms would be observed. All right. Now, of course, this we can be very cynical about it, but that was the rationale. Okay. And um, whereas if uh, a French colony, for instance, wanted Chinese migrants to go as to Mauritius, for instance, all right, they would not be able to leave from Hong Kong because it was not a British territory. And the British government and the Hong Kong government could not be sure that the contract terms would be observed and that the laborers would be protected. Okay. Now, this is their, their explanation. But of course, there's always another side of it. And the other side of it was because we know that all the countries were competing for bodies, right? Everybody wanted more bodies. And so they would make sure that there were enough bodies to go to British territories. Okay. And then in 1872 in Hong Kong, we passed another act which was um, to uh, um, fight against kidnapping. All right. So in Hong Kong, you had these comparatively pro comparative protection for uh, passengers. Um, Macau did not have these rules, all right? So for Macau, the ship owners like Macau more, all right? For passengers, they liked Hong Kong more, all right? So, so it's um, And one of the reasons, of course, because Hong Kong was in, uh, is in the mouth of the Pearl River Delta, I think we have to really, really hurry. Uh, yeah, Hong Kong is right, at, and most of the people who went from the Pearl River Delta would it's very easy for them to take ship to Hong Kong. All right, we'll, we'll come back to that. But the the fact that Hong Kong, Guangzhou, were so close, and Hong, the, a lot of financing came from Guangzhou. A lot of the people came from the counties around uh, Hong Kong. That that was a very important. Point. What that was another reason why Hong Kong was such a popular and such an important immigrant port. Okay, let me go back here. Okay, and Hong Kong was considered safe. Many of the people who went aboard, the apparent, particularly people who made money in Australia and Hong Kong, would come to Hong Kong and invest in Hong Kong. They would send the money to Hong Kong to buy property. They would come to Hong Kong to set up business. So one of the most famous businesses in Hong Kong, the Wing On and the Sincere Companies, were set up by people who returned from Australia, immigrants. <gasps> immigrants who returned from Australia. And you, I'm sure you all know the Wing On and Sincere Companies, right? Yeah. I'm totally, my time management is very poor. Anyway, so we have the gold rush. We have the Chinese going everywhere. Uh, and to, to find gold in California and, 
and New Zealand, and you can see it's for some reason they're all around the Pacific. All right. This is a good story. Um, so where did the where did the migrants come from? So most of them for the for the gold for the gold. All right to California and um, the other gold countries. When they first went to uh, San Francisco, they called it Gold Mountain, Gamsan, Jinshan. And then when later, when uh, gold was discovered in Australia, Australia became the new Gold Mountain, the Xin Jinshan, and um, Sa San Francisco became the Jiu Jinshan, right? But in fact, this term, Jinshan, became a very broad term because everybody in people's minds, any place that where they can make easy money is Jinshan. Right. And these are some of the numbers of people going from counties in, in the south, in the Pearl River area. Do we have any Toisan people here? Any Toisan people here? Okay. Well, they were the, from Seiyap, Siyi. They were the main largest numbers. But I want you to see this because just to show that they, where the origins were, how many there were, and the number of people who died actually uh, between this period, right? And, uh, and when they went abroad, they sent money home. This is from Kaiping. They sent money home to build really very grand built homes. And so everybody around would say, wow, this guy went to gold mountain and make so much money, so we have to go to, we have to make sure our sons go and make sure that our daughter marry somebody who went, all right? So this, this whole image grew up and um, it's more. Now these are immigrants from Hong Kong, from the new territories, all right? These people, this is in Songjing, uh, Sunshin. They went to um, Southeast Asia. And when they came back, they decided to settle in Hong Kong, in this place called Songjing Sanshin. Hakka people, and many of them were Christians. Right? So the Hakka, especially those who went to North Borneo, had a particular community, which was a Christian community. And this is in uh, Wohang, in um, New Territories. And a villager went over to Annam, made a lot of money, came back and built this home. So you can see there's a certain uh, common, the, the designs were quite common among these, these homes, right? And what was the impact of migration on Hong Kong? I'm going to make this really, really quick. Uh, um, when people went, Chinese people went overseas, particularly to places like Southeast, to California, they created markets for goods from China or from Southeast Asia, right? So um, from Hong Kong, there will be a lot of food, a lot of clothes, shoes, uh, opera, medicine being sent to the consumers in San Francisco. All right? And from California, they'll be sending back things like Faki, some right, American ginseng, quicksilver, which was very, very big, wheat and flour. And that was very big too. So here, the, the trades would, would coincide. The food that was sent from Hong Kong to San Francisco, of course, were not grown in Hong Kong. So you have sea cucumber and swallow's nest, bird's nest, and shark's fin, all of these very, very expensive foods, and Chinese medicine like dong chong chou and so forth. All of these would first come to Hong Kong from the north and from the south, right, Southeast Asia, from Australia. And they would go to San Francisco and they would spread out from San Francisco, right? And the goods that came from San Francisco would go to Hong Kong and also spread out all over Hong Kong. Now, on the China side, there was an old trade called the Nam Bak Hong, which is the south-north trade, all right? So this were goods coming in up and down the China coast into Southeast, Southeast Asia. With the gold mountain trade, the two trades coincided. So you have a north-south trade and a southeast-west south trade. And this is really important because it was this intersection of the trades that make Hong Kong such an important hub. So it's not just shipping, it's not just passenger trade, but trade, all kinds of trade as well, all right? 
And the second thing is really important is that I'm going to try to finish this in about two minutes. The overseas Chinese sent a lot of money back. The Chiao Hui was very, very important. So the money came coming back to the villages in South China actually supported the livelihood and, and supported a lot of the building of infrastructures and schools and bridges, libraries, big homes, businesses, railroads, and so forth. All right? So the money coming from overseas was a very important source of, so of the uh, southern Chinese economy. All right? and, but what is important was most of that money came through Hong Kong. So Hong Kong became the foreign exchange center. American gold would come to Hong Kong and it would be changed to silver before it was taken back to the villages in China. Because in China in the 19th century, most of the people prefer to use silver. So silver was expensive in China, gold was expensive outside of China. So the gold comes to Hong Kong, was sold into silver, and the gold remained quite cheap. So the European and the American banks would come and buy gold from Hong Kong. So Hong Kong became a really, really important exchange center. All right? It still is today. And the roots go way back. And there was a cultural exchange. One of the most important, funniest things that I, I often find is American immigrants sent their children home, sent their children to Hong Kong to learn Chinese. Chinese immigrants in Southeast Asia sent the children to Hong Kong to learn English. So there is this interchange. Hong Kong is a very important interchange. Okay, okay. Some immigrants actually sent these kids to um, to the home villages so that they learn how to take care of their grandparents and stuff like that. But Hong Kong was a very important um, place for education for overseas Chinese. All right. And so there was a wealth investment and so forth. And there's a return of bones. I've just spent two minutes to talk about. Do I have two minutes? <laughs> Well, I'm past my two minutes, but anyway. This is an overdraft, right? The return of bones. One of the most important things that Hong Kong did was to enable Chinese who had died overseas to be buried at home, in their home villages. One of the most tragic things for Chinese people in the 19th century was to die overseas. All right, so if you go to California, if you go to California, if you go to Melbourne and Sydney, and you, your aim was to go there and make a lot of money and come home, right? But it doesn't always happen like that. So if you got sick and you died there, what do you do, right? Now, the very, very rich people could afford to be sent home in coffins, but that was very expensive because you have to preserve the body, right? The people who are less wealthy would first be buried locally in San Francisco or in Vancouver or wherever. And in a few years, the bones will be picked up and they'll be cleaned and they will be put into bone boxes and sent back to China. All right? And then they will be sent back to the home villages where the children will make offerings to them. All right? One of the worst things about dying overseas was that no one will make offerings to you. I mean, not you, to you, but <laughs> to the diseased person, right? And the diseased person, when he's not, when the diseased person did not receive offerings of clothes or food, particularly of food, what will happen to him? He becomes a hungry ghost. He becomes a hungry ghost and he will haunt people and he will do terrible things to the living. Gu wan ye gui, right? Gu hun ye gui. That is like the scariest things you can imagine, all right? So the person who died did not want to be a hungry ghost. Right? His friends around him in San Francisco also didn't want a hungry ghost around them. <laughs> so it was really important to send his bones back to China so that he would rest in peace. All right? And that is why one of the things that got sent from Hong Kong to San Francisco a lot was joss paper, like ritual paper and things you can burn. And, right. and so to make sure that all the rituals were followed very uh, strictly, right? And a lot of ritual masters were sent over too to make sure you had the feng shui and zha, yeah, you know, pick the right dates and so forth. So migration involved a lot of ritual exchange, all right? A lot of 
ritual migration as well. Okay. So, so the bones that were picked up in New Zealand or in M Melbourne or wherever would come through Hong Kong. And in Hong Kong, they would be collected and they will be stored. And the people in Hong Kong would try to contact the families at home. All right, so say Mr. Leung, he's from Toi San. All right, so somebody will go to Toi San and look out, look for his wife or his children or whatever and say, okay, Mr. Leung's box bones are coming. So we will send it to you and please make sure somebody will pick up the boxes at the pier. Okay, so there was a lot of, a lot of work because even finding the bones in San Francisco would be very difficult. These bones, people would die not in the center of town. They died in all over the places in California. I mean, it's California, Nebraska, wherever, Oregon, and they could be all over the place. And if you can imagine how isolated these places were. And very often, they would be told, okay, uh, Mr. Mr. Lung died somewhere. And sometimes you would, they had to hire Indian scouts to take them to these places. And they'd take the horses and the donkeys up there, right? So, that's a long, long, very hard work. So they would go and they would try and find the, 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 the burial place and they would exhume the bones, put it in the, and they do all kinds of rituals to make sure that everything was clean. Now, sometimes they didn't find the bones and when they didn't find the bones, the ritual master will call for the spirit of this person to come back and put it in a box. And this is the Zhao Hun Shang, all right? So this Xiang would, just like bone boxes, they would put it aside, the pe person's name would be put in the silver metal and put aside, and all these would be transported back to Hong Kong, all right? And in Hong Kong, the organizations would contact the homes, the, vi the, the families, to wait for these things to go there, all right? And today, of course, we look at this and say, wow, this is interesting. But in those days, it really meant a lot to the man who died, to his friends overseas, and to the families, right? Oops. Mm. I, I, I can't make this move. Oh, this is... This is the Dunhua Hospital coffin home. It's just along Victoria Road. I don't know, you probably pass it every day you come to work. It's where all the cemeteries are, mm -hmm. this is the Dunhua Hospital coffin home. And many, many thousands and thousands of thousands of coffins and the bone boxes are there. Okay? <laughs> that came back from all over the world, would be stored here until they were ready to ship back to the home villages. I mean, it's a fantastic, I, I think it's a fantastic story in human history that so many people were able to be buried back in, home, in, in the home villages. But not only that, but how many people were involved in making this possible, right? Mm -hmm. And so this is uh, when they're one of the graves of the pe of person who, who was buried back. And this is a really amazing map. This is a Doma Hospital um, story, and they use the documents, they use the records in the Doma coffin home to identify the places that had sent coffins back to Hong Kong and from Hong Kong back to China, all right? So you can see they were actually practically all over the world. Now, of course, Europe didn't count that much in from the 19th, from the mid, before, any time before the 20th, uh, mid 20th century, all right? So before the mid 20th century, most of it was Southeast Asia, North America, South America, Australia, and um, the Pacific Islands. All right. So these places all sent their coffins back through China to, um, to the home villages. And most of the home villages are along the south, south coast, mm -hmm. actually. It's just an enormous undertaking, and it's global, right? And it's just it's just a very moving story. And in the process of doing all that, we have a lot of networks are built up. I know. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. So, um, 
So th th as a result of this, a lot of charities grew up, and particularly the charity, that, uh, charitable organization, the Doma Hospital, which was set up to take care of the immigrants, to take, up, to take care of the dead immigrants as well, right, and to make sure everything was okay. So you had lots of networks that were set up, and these networks were inter intersected each other, okay. And so my conclusion, migration was important to Hong Kong, both the going out and the coming back, right? Hong Kong was important to Chinese migration, and uh, Hong Kong was um, important to the Chinese diaspora as a whole, okay, I'm just... And I just want to emphasize this term, the in-between place I've used. I've used Hong Kong as a, is a transient place, but it shows that the migration doesn't always go from just A to B. In the process, people go past through different points, all right? And these points could all be very important in shaping the, the migration experience and shaping the, the, the <laughs> migration <laughs> process. Okay, I'm just going to end this with one last photograph. And this is the waterfront of Hong Kong in the 1920s. This is the Xin Si Gong Si. You see the word Xian? There's Xian Si Gong Si. You know where it is now. It's about the same. And there are a lot of inns in the waterfront, all right? A lot of inns where the migrants could to stay overnight. And a lot of the Gold Mountain countries there. And there's something called the it's a bigger, slightly bigger. The Da You Ya Pian Gong Si, right? Oh. This is the opium company. Opium was very, very big. Opium was one of the main exports from Hong Kong. R um, prepared opium. Right. It was a very, very big thing. One day we can talk about opium. <laughs> and there are banks that would change your currencies. And so this is, I, I love this photograph because it shows how much Hong Kong faces the world. All right, you look at the, Okay. <laughs> well, let us give um, Professor Sin a big round of applause. Um, I think you would all agree with uh, me that uh, in a short well, one hour time, we have a fantastic history of, uh, of Hong Kong. And a, a lot of us here from Hong Kong, our, we all have some story connected mm. to, to this topic mm. from our grandparents' generation. So without further ado, let, let us take the time for some questions, which I'm sure that you, you may have, and this is a fantastic opportunity uh, for also um, those who are joining us online, uh, you may leave some question uh, in the, in the uh, I believe in the chat box. Uh, or if uh, among our audience you have questions, uh, please uh, just raise your hand and um, tell us who you are. And um, yes, please. Hi. Hey, Hi, thank you for, for, for your Fantastic uh, presentation today. Uh, I'm uh, Yvon Huang from Beijing uh, Global University. I'm a professor there. Uh, actually, from my own background, I understand quite well about your talk because most of my, my grandpa is the only one who's dead in the mainland China. Mm -hmm. And all his brothers, even his uh, either brother or his younger brothers, uh, obviously uh, immigrated to uh, all parts of the uh, yeah. war. Mm -hmm. So I quite understand many of your uh, presentations and findings here. But there's one question from my mind. I come up with uh, why your research year stopped at the year of 1950. I guess there's some reason for me. I have my answer, but I, mm -hmm. I would like to uh, uh, ask you why, is your, why you, you stop here? Just because there is some kind of watershed of the year there, or, or just because you there you were one hundred years. years, 100 years. Is that, well, it's a hundred years, and also if I went on any longer, I will be here all night, and you'll be here all <laughs> night as well. No, 1949 was a watershed, right? Because it be, uh, the People's Republic of China started to have a different overseas Chinese policy. The Qiao Wu was, was different, they have a different attitude. So from then onwards, the uh, connections between Overseas Chinese and the and the diaspora uh, the, between China and the diaspora changed, and that also changed. But of course, by nineteen seventy nine, everything changed back. Yeah. But that's a that's a very good question. And in fact, in nineteen forty nine, many of the coffins and the bone boxes in the Doma Hospital couldn't go back to China anymore. Yeah. 
And, but for Hong Kong, it was really important because Hong Kong then became even more important because many of the people who couldn't, couldn't go back to China came to Hong Kong and settled in Hong Kong. And many of the people who couldn't go to America came to Hong Kong. So Hong Kong became the meeting place for split up families. Yeah. And, and also really important, I think this is really important, because after, after that, after China was, became more isolated, Hong Kong became to overseas Chinese, particularly to young people, Hong Kong became the image of modern China. So they watch Hong Kong TV, they watch Hong Kong movies, they bought Hong Kong magazines and read Hong Kong books, right? So for, for the period that China was closed, from about 1950 to 78, 79, Hong Kong was, to many overseas Chinese, modern China. Yeah. And I think if you are interested, you should study that period. <laughs> so in a way, Hong Kong was not the bridge, Hong Kong was it, right? We are running slightly out of time because <laughs> our, our next part will be the discuss, discussion okay. um, uh, amount of you um, discussant. But uh, before we move to that, do we have another question? A short one. Um, if not, then we'll have a slight break of, let's say, um, two minutes. So um, <laughs> before we do that, let, let us thank uh, once again um, those who are joining us online. Uh, so. Uh, we will uh, end our uh, online um, program here. And for those who are staying here, we will take a break of about two minutes and then we'll start again with a discussion. Thank you. Bye. Bye.